Matthew chapter 6, we will be looking at verses 25 through 34, so if you will open up your Bibles, pull out your highlighters and your pins, if you will, uh, I will give you some words to highlight and possibly some thoughts to jot down, hopefully. I'll start with this, First Peter, it's a scripture, and I think Peter understood this scripture very well, and so he writes it down. In 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, Cast all your cares or all your anxieties or worries upon him, that is Jesus Christ, for he cares for you. And that pretty much summarizes within, within one verse uh, the whole message in the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ will describe some worries, some cares, some concerns. He, he will describe through illustrations. He will give us details on how we should not worry, that we should take those worries and we should cast those worries on the Lord because our Lord cares for us more than all the birds of the, of the air. And so Peter then surmises it all into this one statement that we are to cast all our anxieties upon Him, Jesus, who cares for us. Now that's easily said, right? Then done. Easily said. Oh yeah, I don't have any worries in the world. And I look at the person and say, right. You're lying to me. You have another problem. You're a liar. <laughs> no, we all have worries in this world. We all struggle in our relationships, in our jobs, in our homes, whatever to the vehicles. Uh, you can just only imagine all the worries that we have had from time to time. In our illnesses, boy, that can be a big worry for some that have a chronic illness and they don't know how they're going to provide for their family because they're sick. And that person totally understands those anxieties. Oh, but the person that isn't sick is the one that doesn't understand those anxieties. And they don't oftentimes have the compassion for those that are sick. And so we can cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. You know, since people do not always recognize they don't always recognize their service to mammon. And we've been studying this last week. We can't serve two masters. You're going to love one or you're going to love the other. You can't serve money. You can't give your life to it. Otherwise, it masters over you. You can't just serve it and then serve the Lord here and there. Because one will master over you. No, we need to give our service to the Lord. But as I said people don't always recognize their service to money. They really don't recognize it or they ignore it. It, it, it really does enslave us when, when we have a master like money or mammon, as Jesus put it. And Jesus is going to give us a really solid illustration that anxiety is about life's necessities which are incomparable with the all-encompassing nature of the claim of God's kingdom. You can't compare all of the worries that we have to God himself who will provide for all of our needs. It's just, it's, there's no comparison whatsoever. God is far greater, far mightier, and far more willing and capable of taking care of us than we could ever think or imagine. Let's look at the text, and as we look at the text here in these few verses, 25 through 34, I want to show you just a, a, a quick overlook without reading it, how many times the word therefore is mentioned. If you look at it really quickly, you will notice in verse 25, verse 31 and 34, three times, therefore, therefore, therefore. And we know when, whenever someone says therefore, you always look, wherefore did that come from? What did they say before that? And so I could be sharing with you a whole message and then at the end I say, therefore now, all that I said, go out there and do it. That's what Jesus is doing here. He, he, he's giving us his word and then he's saying, therefore now do this, therefore now do this. Three times he says that. And so there is action that needs to take place in our lives. There's decisions that we need to make <coughs> by casting our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. Also, look at the word worry. Verse 25, it's, it's mentioned there. Verse 27, it's mentioned. Verse 28, verse 31, verse 34, it's mentioned twice. Six times. Six times it's mentioned. So, I think Jesus understands that we have worries. 
totally understands our hearts, totally understands our concerns, whatever those concerns can be out. You might be worrying about this church. You might be worrying about the leadership of this church, whether it's a good leadership or whether it's not good leadership. And, and those worries can consume you. They can stress you out. In fact, they can make you make decisions that, that really aren't founded on facts. And that's what worry does. And we're going to really exhaust this. So this morning, my, my theme is, you know, the old don't worry, be happy theme. Um, do not worry. We shouldn't worry. We can cast those worries on the Lord. Anxiety or worry is an uneasy feeling of uncertainty. We just really don't know all of the information based upon the situation and so we can become aggravated. We can become dreadful. We can even become fearful because we don't know what is going to happen. Uh, I've noticed that with my illness. Uh, every time I go to do something, I'm wondering, is this going to bring me over the edge? Am I going to fall right back to the very beginning? And that can be so fearful. So you don't do things. You know? And I have to do things. I have to figure out where my limits are. And, and when I hit that limit, usually I pay for it for a couple of days. This last time, I, I, I actually went to the beach and I thought, can I boogie board? Haven't done that in six years. Six years, something that I, I, I love doing. And I thought, I'll get out there. And I actually went out with the kids and got my one, one to two footers with them, teaching them how to boogie board and got my rode my one or two footers. Uh, last week or the week before, I, I was out there and there were some four footers out there. In my head, I'm thinking, do I try this? Those are four footers. Will I get hurt? So the fear and all this dread comes into play. And I thought, you got to try it. You just got to do it. Gabby says, you live life once, Dad or Grandpa. Poppy, go do it, you know. And so I did it, and I paid for it. It took me a whole week. I'm still suffering a little bit from it. So I know my limit there is no four-footers. Stick with the one-footers with the kids. But those type of things bring about anxiety. The most common word in the Old English version of the Bible will render this word anxiety or worries as thoughts. Thoughts, because that's what they are, right? Is thoughts. All our worries are thoughts, or those worries, or another word that it uses, cares, cares, cares. So Jesus had just been sp speaking about mammon and speaking about God and how there's no comparison. You can't serve one or the other. You have to choose to serve God. God. And so he's going to build upon this. So in verse 25, he says, therefore, I say to you, looking back at verse 24, the verse before that, no one can serve two masters, for neither he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. That's what the Bible says. So therefore, he says, this is what you do. Do not worry about your life. Why do you serve mammon? To, to preserve your life, to meet your needs, to pay your bills, to pay the government, you know, to pay for your nice ride, for your nice home, for all those things that you enjoy. And if you are putting 110% into that, then you're not putting anything into the Lord. Jesus is saying, put 110% into the Lord and don't worry about that says, do not worry about your life. The cognate noun here of worry is care. Now this is, this is interesting because this is the Greek here and it kind of gives you a better idea of what's happening when we worry, um, which was formally de derived from the word a part. So part of the Greek word is a part, a, a part of something or a, a dividing. There's a division there. And so we can explain it as dividing cares or distracting the heart from its true object of life. It's divided. In other words, your heart becomes divided is what he's saying. That's what worrying is. Is that when you're looking at a situation, now your heart then begins to be divided and it either is going to go in one direction or in the other direction. Either you're going to trust God or either you're going to freak out over the situation. So your heart becomes divided. And that's a great definition of the word 
Because those emotions and feelings inside of you, that's exactly what happens. You become divided within your own thoughts and then your heart and then your actions are a response to it. One dictionary said, anxiety is a state of mind wherein one is concerned about something or someone. Most of our worries is about something or someone. A lot of times it's someone. And we just cannot stop thinking about that someone. And that someone just rubs us the wrong way. That someone just said this. That someone just did that. And we just can't sleep all night because we're thinking about that someone or something. The state of mind may range from genuine concern or obsession that originates from a distorted perspective of life. It can be genuine, or it can just be your perspective of what you think that individual is thinking about you. And oftentimes, it is that. We really don't know the facts, we don't know what they're thinking, but we have this idea or this thought, and it becomes obsessive, and in reality, they weren't even thinking it at all. I remember someone saying this, that, 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 If you think someone's thinking about you or the majority of people are thinking about you, the fact is that they're probably not thinking about you at all. And yet we get so concerned because someone may be thinking about us. You see this in elderly quite often as as they get older and they start getting uh, dementia. Their minds are are starting to wander. Um, I have a relative that was uh, was going through this where, where they were just feeling like people were talking about them. You know, they would tell me, you know, I, I see them over there and they're like whispering and I hear my name. And so I was like, they don't like me and they're just talking about me. Why would they talk about me? Why don't they care? You know, and they had come up with all these things and it just brought them anxiety. And they didn't want to be around the family members. So Jesus here um, will talk about first our anxieties over food and clothing. Those basic necessities that we need in life. Now, Jesus did not prohibit genuine concerns about food and shelter. I mean, that's not what he's talking about. Um, We should have concerns. Uh, We should work. Uh, We should do whatever we can to provide for our family. But he is teaching that we should keep a proper perspective. A proper perspective. We should make God's kingdom the first priority. Everything else will fall into into line after we do that, making his kingdom the priority. The call... The call not to be anxious about the basic human needs is a profound challenge uh, to our very survival because we have to live. We have to clothe ourselves. We have to provide for our family. So Jesus isn't suggesting that we do nothing to meet our physical needs, but that we keep our needs in proper perspective and trust God rather than worrying about them. Trust God. We should do our best and then commit the rest to the Lord. Because there are things that we have no control over. And those are the things we give unto the Lord. Remember when you had your first boyfriend or girlfriend? And all the worrying that, that came just from that itself. Do they really love me? Do they not love me? There's a lot of stress going on there. There's a lot of worrying. Jesus says, don't worry at all. Worry has been defined as a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. I like that picture. Because you just keep thinking of the same thing. Eventually it creates a channel and all the other thoughts just follow down that path to fear and anxieties. So he says, don't worry what you will eat or what you will drink. Uh, People worry about where their next meals are going to come from. Uh, In our community, they worry about where their next meals are going to come from. Well, God's provided. We have a pantry here. And they can come here and they can get food. And there are many pantries throughout the community that you can go to and get food. Uh, God has provided through His people to take care of the homeless, to take care of those that have need, to take care of those in the body that don't have jobs. God will always provide. In the 30 years that I've been here, I have never seen anyone starve to death. Not once. America is probably the, the homeless are probably richer than those in third world countries. God always provides. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, about your body, what you will put on. Now, there's two possibilities there, um, what you will wear. 
whether it, it, it's to keep you safe from the exposures to the elements of, of, of those things outside of you or whether it's more towards your appearance, what you think other people are thinking about you because of what you're wearing. So it, it could be that Jesus is saying here, look, don't worry about protecting yourself against the elements. I will cover that. I will take care of that. Or he could be saying, you shouldn't be worrying about your dress to impress someone else. Uh, that's ridiculous. That's not how you live your, your life. And then he's going to uh, give us uh, an example here in a minute about uh, Solomon when he talks about that. So we find that food, clothing are frequently paired together in, in our basic human needs. You know, we need food, we need clothing. And Jesus is just suggesting that we trust in him for those very things. And so he says in the next, next statement, Is not life, that is breath in the spirit, more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now in the context, he's talking about how we walk life here. Yes, our life, what we breathe and we're spirit. But how is our life? Is it more than just going out and buying clothing and food? There's more to life than that, he's saying. There's a kingdom that exists. What could be more important than survival of ourselves? Well, there is something more important. And Jesus tells us what's more important. It's our lives and how we live our lives on this earth is what's important. You can have all the food in the world and if you're not living for the Lord, it's nothing. You can have nothing to eat and clothe yourself and live for the Lord and that's something. We should care more about how we live than how we eat. The spiritual should, be, should go before the bodily and the eternal before the temporal. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. I love bird watching. I love to see those little guys you know, flying all over the place. Uh, they, they, they do the little tunes outside our windows and you hear them chirping and then talking to each other. And you know, I really think they have great personalities. I love their daredevilness, you know, how they fly around and stuff. You come here on, on Balgrave and you watch them. Well, there used to be a, a, a power line. And they used to just sit up there, hundreds and hundreds of birds. And you drive by and they all go, let's see who can, who can uh, uh, dodge that car. And they all come down by your car and they go right in front of you and you almost hit a couple of them. And you just wonder, what are they doing? Why do they do that? You know? And I think they're talking to each other, a bunch of little kids, saying, let's see who can dodge that car. You know? And they're trying to dodge. And you wonder where they go because you don't see them flying out the back of your vehicle. But I love watching them. And what Jesus is saying here is, look, the birds are without care. They're without care and they can teach us something about reliance on God. He says, For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Look, they don't engage in any future planting. They, they don't go out and, and make furrows and plant seeds. They don't store up food for the future. They don't do any of that. Yet, God, through His natural order, takes care of them. He feeds them. They do not engage in agricultural processes. They don't sow their crops. They just enjoy the food that God has provided and yet they don't starve they don't starve at all God has provided for them <clears throat> they're not idle they're not lazy you ever watch a hummingbird and how it works for its food and yet God has provided that food for it because it searches and Jesus is not counseling about being believers that are lazy he's not saying that don't sit back well God's going to provide for me no get out there and work do something He's given you a job. You know, Ephesians 2.8 says that He has prepared every good work for you. And, and so if a job comes along and you can work it, work it. Because that's a good work to do for your family. The Bible also says that if you don't work, you don't eat. You're worse than an unbeliever if you don't provide for your family. And so you need to do that, definitely. But know that the provision comes from the Lord. Sometimes we're bird brains. You know, we just want to sit back and do nothing. We grow... Anxious, knowing worry will only turn on us and stress us out. And so stop worrying. Sometimes that worrying will build barriers between us and God. And we don't want those barriers. We want to trust in Him. So as what Peter said is true. Cast those worries upon Him. I don't like it, but having daily, my daily needs met by the Father is exactly where He wants us to trust in Him. He goes on and says, Are you not of more value than they? I would highlight that you word there. Are you? 
And in the Greek, it's emphatic. Jesus is saying, are you? I mean, he's saying you. And he's pointing at them. You are more valuable than birds. You're more valuable than birds. Every one of you are more valuable in the eyes of God than any animal on this earth. And this question that Jesus is asking demands a positive answer. Yes. Yes, I am. Now, don't get arrogant about it, but you are important to the Lord, and you are valued. And when you have this pessimist attitude that you're not, that you're useless, that you're no good, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Because God says, you are more valuable than the birds of the air. And his point is, is if God takes care of them, how much more will he take care of you, who he loves, and send his son to die on the cross? So worrying is wrong because it represents a failure to trust God as our provider. It's a sin to worry. Look at verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can even add one cubit to his statue? Now, a cubic literally was measured from the elbow to the fingers. So roughly about 18 inches. How many of you can add to your statue? Now, two possibilities there. He's either talking about height. How many of you can add to your height? Can you, can you add an inch? Can you add 18 inches to your height? Or he could be saying, how many of you can extend your life? Because that word statue can also mean life. Can you extend your life beyond what God has given you? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. We are to bless the name of the Lord. That's what we should do. Not worry about extending our lives or heightening our lives. You know, you can actually extend your height. <clears throat> they do it um, through surgical procedures. I don't know if you knew that. But they will literally take your legs and they will cut you right in half. And they will extend braces a half an inch or so at a time, put them together and let the bone grow again. And people have been known to increase their height by two inches. It takes years, but you can do it. I'm God. I can extend my height. I, I don't have to. <laughs> no, Jesus isn't talking about that. He's not talking about that. He uses, you know, really funny illustrations at times. You know, I remember the illustration of the camel going through the eye of the needle compared to a rich man entering the kingdom of God. You go, how can a camel go through the eye of a needle? Exactly. And so he's talking about the rich man, so he can't get into heaven. You can't get a camel through the eye of a needle. And you can't get a rich man to heaven. No, the only way a rich man can go to heaven is he's surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior. So, <clears throat> worrying is, is futile. Uh, worship, worrying spends a lot of time shoveling smoke. I like that picture, right? Shoveling smoke, you just can't. It's useless. Why even try? Uh, why engage it? <clears throat> Worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but you're not going to get anywhere. You're just rocking all over the place. Now, Jesus gives two examples to demonstrate the senselessness of worrying here. One is you can't add to your height. There's no cubics uh, uh, that you can do to, to, to lengthen yourself. And, and also, you can't lengthen your life if that's the case. It's impossible because it's the Lord that gives. So why worry at all? Just put your faith and trust in Him. We create more problems for ourselves than anyone else because of the worries that we have, because of the anxieties that we have. Because we're thinking outside there is something that is trying to get us when in reality it's not trying to get us at all. You know, we're either pessimists or we're optimists, right? You know what a pessimist is, one who sees a negative in everything? That's me. I'm, I'm the pessimist. If I see a cup half half empty, I think it's half empty. An optimist is one who sees a positive. I see it half full. And there's a big difference there. And how many are pessimists here? I am. I'm raising my hand. So quite a few. How many are optimists? How many don't even know what you are? How many are both? I think all of us should be raising our hand at that because we should recognize that we're pessimists, but we're trying to be optimists because God's in control. And He has our lives in His hands. There is a big difference there. Thomas Jefferson said, a pessimist is someone who feels bad when he feels good for fear he'll feel worse when he feels better. That's a pessimist, right? <laughs> uh, seriously, I mean, it's funny, but you, that's how a person feels. 
I'm going to feel better, but then I'm going to feel worse that I feel better. Because I feel guilty that I'm going to feel better, you know? I think like that at times. I totally understand this. Uh, if you're a pessimist or an op- optimist, we, we should really be a, a, a Jesus Christus. We should just lay it all before him. Uh, worry can't change any situation at all. You just can't change it that way. Jesus said, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Look at the lilies of the field. The, the finest clothing can't compare to the excellencies of God's creation. Uh, you get the best clothing, you look out there in a the field and you see these beautiful colors, you go, wow. Go to Bishop in the mountains during the fall and the leaves change colors from oranges to yellows and they're falling, you just go, wow. You see the snow caps, you see the mountain range, you go, wow. How can you compare that to clothing? You can't at all. Now he's probably thinking more of the wildflowers that God has created. He's not talking about man's human cultivation or genetic engineering and manipulating flowers to look like something. No, he's just talking about God's natural order and how he's created things. You know that lilies don't force themselves to grow? They just reach for the sun. They just reach for the sun and they naturally grow. We should reach for the sun. We shouldn't toil. We shouldn't sweat to work. You know, they don't sweat, they don't toil, they don't sit there and try to mend themselves or, or anything like that. They just enjoy the sun and they grow beautiful. You know, when we spend time with the sun, we'll grow beautiful. When we spend time at his feet, we'll trust in him. When we spend time with him, we know that he will take care of us and watch over us at all times. And yet, verse 29, I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these Solomon had nothing on my creation, is what Jesus is saying. <clears throat> the greatest robes of Solomon. Solomon's worth $14 billion at this time. <clears throat> he couldn't make anything compared to what God made <clears throat> in his creation. Notice Jesus didn't mention what he wore, what kind of shoes, what kind of clothes, or anything like that. He just said, it's uncomparable. I'm not even going to mention it compared to the beauty that I have made. In fact, you know what Solomon said about it all? Vanity, 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 that's all it is. Vanity means worthless. It's worthless. So when someone says you're vain, they're saying you're worthless because all you're thinking about is yourself. And that's worthless, a waste of time. Solomon's wardrobe was nothing compared to the glorious creation. Now if God, verse 30, so clothes the grass, the wild grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, so you get his point here, the Hebrews would use whatever they could to fire up their kennels, to fire up their, their ovens and their fire pits to, to warm themselves. They used whatever it was, whether it was grad, whether it was wood, whether it was charcoal, shrubs, thorns, vine branches, trimmings, animals. I mean, they'd burn the animals. A human dung, animal dung they would burn also. Even uh, blood strained clothing if they had it, they'd burn, they burned everything. And what Jesus is saying, look, if God created the beauty on this world of the lilies, and yet it's gone tomorrow and consumed in your fires and your ovens, that's what he's saying there. How can you, how can you compare that to you? Look, at he says, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? If he takes care of them, how much more will he take care of you? And then he he really lays it out that we're people of little faith. We really don't trust him. We really don't. We don't trust him enough to show by our action. There's a lack of faith in the church today. I think that's why our nation is where it's at, because of the lack of faith. And, and we know what James says about faith, right? Faith is not just believing. Understand that, please? Get this, faith is not just believing something. Faith is believing with action in it. And James is clear, if you have faith, you'll also have works behind that faith. That faith works. If you have no works, you have no faith. If you say, I believe in Jesus, but sit here and then go home and live your life, you don't believe in Jesus. That faith is not going to save you. If you say you believe in Jesus and then you're at the Summerfest 
and you're helping and serving and you're here helping with the with the mobile unit if you're here serving if you're here doing then you have faith that has works with it so faith always demands a work faith is not just oh yeah i have faith i believe no believe literally means trust and cling to that's what the word belief means and so jesus is saying you're a person of little faith you don't really believe that i can take care of you i mentioned it last week look at your checkbook how much of it goes to the lord and that will really show you. Consider that. I'm, I'm serious here for a second. I know I'll get in trouble, but serious. Look at your checkbook. Look at your checkbook and, and ask yourself, okay, how much is really going to the Lord? Let me calculate it here. And, and, and then if it hits 10%, right on. Praise the Lord. You're doing it. But if it doesn't, you have to be honest with yourself and say, okay, Lord, I'm a, I'm a person of little faith because I really don't trust you here. I don't think you can provide for my needs. I want to then take that step of faith and do it and watch how he does it. Watch how he does it. You know, it's funny. At the Summerfest, I actually um, met someone from Edison, where I worked for. He stopped me. He said, hey, Ruben, you remember me? I can't remember his name now. And and he had just hired on when I had just left. And so we got talking, and I was talking to him for a while. and, and, And... He's telling me how it's all changed now, and I was telling him how when I was there, some of the things that I was involved in. So he remembers me. He goes, oh, yeah, everybody knows you. Everybody knows how how you worked over there and and stuff and what you were involved in and stuff. And then I started asking about some of the guys, you know. Hey, is Basil still there? And he goes, oh, yeah, he's, like, running not just our department, another department. And then he started naming names like like Bernardo. I'm like, Bernardo's like, yeah, he's actually with Basil now. I'm like, you're kidding me. Sid is a supervisor, Joe's a supervisor, Paul Milan's a supervisor, you know, just kind of going over. I was really excited, you know. <clears throat> and I said, hey, I just saw Phil Nicholson. He goes, yeah, he just retired. I go, yeah, he was telling me that. <clears throat> and I said, he's got to be a millionaire, right? And he goes, oh, man, he's taken care of. I mean, he's just taken care of. And I started thinking about that because when I left, I had a good, good chunk in stock, Edison stock. They would match a 6%. And so up to 6%, they just match your, your stock. And I started thinking about, so these guys are retiring and they're millionaires. He goes, oh, yeah, more than millionaires. A couple of millions in some of them. And I'm just like, I started worrying. I started thinking, man, what did I miss? Why did I quit? I started thinking of all that stuff. And I was thinking, I would be a millionaire right now. I would have enough to retire. I should have, I even thought I should have quit now instead of 10 years ago. And I would have been better off. And I would agree with you if you said you made a bad decision. Yeah, looking at it from now. But, again, when all these worries start to come in and all these thoughts, the Lord would have said, you have little faith. You have little faith. Because you think your your life is in existence because of what you think you would have had. No, your life has been here because of what I've given you. And me and my wife made that decision 11 years ago or so to quit Edison and to leave all of that to serve the Lord. And I, and I told him, I says, you know, I, I love what I do. I really do. Even with the stress and the worries and the cares of being a senior pastor that, that people will never understand, never understand. Um, I love doing it. I really do. had a guy come in Friday and he sat me in the room because I need to talk to you and he just poured his heart out to me and this is a guy that I was hardened to Uh, not a guy that I love like I love all of you that are really sitting here right now he comes once in a while cause some disturbances but then he he leaves it's a guy that I didn't want there because that's what usually what he does and he just shared his heart he says uh, uh, he poured his heart out I'm a sinner and he gave details he goes, I know I am, but I love God. I really do. And he just broke my heart. And he just revealed to me the reason that I do this. And he took his shoe off and he said, look at my foot. It's a big old ball. It's like a tumor. I lifted his shirt. I got tumors all over. And I just, um, I just started crying. I just didn't know what to do. And I said, can I pray for you? He goes, no. No, I thank God for what he's given me. That's it. I don't need no prayer to heal. I don't want any you know, worries or anything. I just thank God for what he has. And I was just 
broken by this man that I had no feelings for at all. That's why I do it. <clears throat> that brought so much joy to me and perspective. That, that you can't pay for. To see someone go through something like that and say, God's in control. Yeah, he's a sinner. Yeah, he's got sin in his life. You know, um, these guys who just got busted for the um, Ashley and Madison scandal. You know, uh, Biden's son who's worrying right now because his name's on the list. And now he's backtracking trying to, you know, justify how his name got on the list, you know, with hundreds of other people that are on this Ashley and Madison list, you know, on how to have an affair and never get caught. And these guys are doing it. And then the clergy, over 400 clergy that are on this list, and they're expecting people to, to uh, be uh, resigning. I'm hearing that there's not as many as they thought there were. I think the, the world is just focusing on the clergy because they don't want to focus on politicians who are really there and all those that are really a part of this whole thing. That brings a lot of worry, a lot of worry. But oh, you of little faith, take a step of faith and trust God. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles, the unbelieving seek after, but not us. Because our Heavenly Father knows that you need what your needs, knows that you need all these things. He knows what you need. He's God. He knows exactly what you need. And so He's aware of those things. So you can trust that He will provide for you. See, when the flesh is ruled over, rules over us it becomes a tyrant and it will consume us but when we trust in God he rules over us and he provides for us and takes care of us he says seek what verse 33 seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness that's what a true disciple does he seeks the kingdom of God first doesn't seek his mammon first the word seek there is, is not necessarily an order, but it is a priority. Sometimes you have to go to work first, but your priority is God first. There's a difference. Sometimes you have to do things in order to provide, but your priority is, is the Lord first. <clears throat> I've always been that way. The boys know this. I, I think it reveals my wife's and I heart that we've always put God first. I remember Virginia brought this to my memory uh, a couple of days ago. Um, <clears throat> we had been here at church and this homeless person came here and uh, we just had a heart to help him out. And my son Simon was having his bridal reception or when, engagement reception, you know, when they got engaged and so the parents first meet and everyone comes to meet and so we had tables out and the whole bit. And I looked at Virginia and I said, hey, I want to ask you something. And she thought in her mind, oh, okay, now what? <laughs> well, he's going to ask me. And I asked her, hey, can we bring this guy to the reception? <laughs> and she's like, yeah. Yeah, I don't see why not. I never, never asked Simon. Never asked Alex. Our heart was to help this individual that was less than us, you know, and lift him up to our level. And so he came, we cleaned him up, and I can't remember what he wore, a shirt or whatever, and he sat right there with everyone else eating at our reception. That's always been our heart. We've always done those things. Not to pat on the back. That's my reward, I guess. But this is the example is seeking kingdom, seeking the kingdom of God first. I don't know what my sons thought about it. I mean, it was an example. I don't even know if they do that. But that's our hearts, was to do things like that. And we've done that throughout the years. Always thought of others more highly. I was just sharing with someone this morning. And, and never expecting repayment. I'm just sharing about how we pour into people. And we've invited them to Thanksgiving and Christmases and so forth. you know. And, and then all of a sudden one day we're like, where are they? They just left. Never said bye, nothing. And that's okay. We still pour into people's hearts. When that first started to happen, I used to tell myself, hey, I'm not going to do that no more. And God says, yeah, you are. Because that's not your heart. You're going to do it whether they stay or not. Because that's my heart. 
And I want God's heart. Whether you stay or not, I'm going to pour into you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to direct you. I'm going to guide you. You go. That's on you, not on me. You know, that's between you and God. But that's seeking the kingdom of God first. Seek him first. All these things, he said, will be added unto you. Um, again, I think of Pastor Chuck Smith. Um, what God has blessed him with because he sought the kingdom of God first. You know, it's funny. Um, this is probably going to get recorded, but who knows if, when, it, when it gets posted, whether it will ever get posted. But it's funny because you're hearing all these pastors now talk more personally about Pastor Chuck. Just went to a luncheon, and, and the pastor there was sitting there saying, you know, Chuck taught us a lot. But he was feral. He was a feral. He ran. He ran things with an iron fist. I'm just like, and I'm hearing this. You know, I'm hearing this. But he sought the kingdom of God. In other words, he believed what he believed, and he wasn't going to change for anyone, whether they thought he was a feral or not. And he did it. And look at how God blessed him personally, because he was faithful to his commitments. Don't worry, Jesus said. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own. He's not saying, look, don't worry today. Worry about tomorrow. No, don't worry about tomorrow even. Because it has its own worries. You know, just put your faith and trust in me. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles here. So let me close. Someone said <clears throat> that ulcers are caused not by what you eat, but by what's eating you. Whatever's eating you, just let it go. Let it go. As Jesus has been trying to explain to us that it's pointless to have anxieties. What we need to do is trust in the Lord. The focus of a believer should be on what ultimately benefits the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Summerfest is just the beginning. I wish the whole church was out there and focused on this kingdom of God. We have seen hundreds of people out there. We have seen people come to the Lord. We have seen love go out to people. It's an amazing event, and God has been a part of that event. You have the Harvest Crusade, which was pretty big. I heard their, their stadium was packed, and over 4,600 people uh, received the Lord and recommitted to the Lord. That event is only put on because a lot of people are involved in that event to put it on, a lot of churches. I think of our little event, which we saw about 400 people there this past Friday. And we have a handful of people that are putting this on. And a few other churches that are there with their booths, but they're not really helping us you know, with, with some of the things going on. We have game booths that Virginia is running, and that's it. We have a few people that are helping in the beginning, but then eventually uh, it's running amok because no one's there to man the booth. So these kids are, are just throwing basketballs all over, kicking them all over, running the booths, and I'm just like, we need help, Lord, right there. But those kids are having fun doing that, so they love that more than anything else. So the Lord's involved in that. But it's amazing how God provides. He gives us strength as they all run around doing different jobs here and there, packing and putting in just a lot of work. That, get, that is involved in that. And I thank God that he has given them the strength to do all that. To do all that. It's just amazing to see God's power work like that. Because to me, it's an event that I, if you were to ask me not knowing, I would have said no. We, we don't have the manpower to do something like that. Again, where I started. Summerfest. Snack bar. This thing in here. It's a lot. I don't know how, how we're going to get it done without the laborers, without people that are kingdom-sinking-minded. It's impossible. But I know the Lord will provide.